know, it's a little darker on that stage than it is in the pew, so it's uh, kind of hard to see when you're trying to read, so I felt the pain this morning, and uh, bad that I'm as blind as a bat as well. So anyway, um, <clears throat> we're thinking this morning about singing. Why is it that we have engaged in singing for an extended period of time? Why is it that Christians throughout the centuries have always engaged in singing? Why is it considered worship? Is it something that we're doing just to kind of fill space uh, because we don't, you know, want me to talk for the whole hour? Or is it something <clears throat> that perhaps is rooted in Scripture and something that needs to be understood? You see, one of the great dangers about coming to worship on a regular basis is that we can turn things and let them become trite. They, we stop thinking about why we're doing them and how we're doing them and what was God's original design. And so as we think about it this morning, I want us to, um, this month, of course, this year, we're studying worship in a congregational sense. And um, <clears throat> so obviously this morning we're talking about singing, and we'll talk about it a little bit more tonight as well. What part does music play in worship? And then next week, we've got um, another special study we have to do. And then the, the last week, the 28th, we're going to spend some time answering the question that a lot of people have um, concerning a cappella music versus instrumental music in worship. What is the disagreement? Where does it exist? Why does it exist? Furthermore, and in my opinion, far more importantly, what does the Bible say about it? Okay, what is, what is the Old Testament usage of it? What's the New Testament usage of it? What did the early church think about it? Um, we're going to try and look at all those things in a fair and balanced way. Um, <clears throat> so that will be a special study we'll set aside for the 28th. That'll be morning and night because it takes probably even more than that to do it real justice. But we're going to give it a shot in two sermons. And if not, well, then I guess we'll just go to three. But um, <clears throat> so this morning we're simply looking at singing in worship okay and so as we do this I want us to first of all this morning we're gonna <clears throat> spend some time as was read for us in Ephesians chapter 5 and I won't reread that but I do want to read a parallel text that you might want to keep your finger at uh, because we will be going back and forth between them and that's in Colossians chapter 3 and the reason I choose these texts is because they they focus and give us the most information about singing as worship uh, than any other text in the New Testament. And so that's why we're looking at these particular texts today. So <clears throat> to kind of put it in its context, let's back up to Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love that binds together in perfect harmony or binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful let the word of Christ dwell in you um, richly teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God and whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father through him so with these texts in mind this morning I simply want to, we're going to, Ephesians 5 is the basis of our study. I want us to put that passage in its context, okay? In its context. Um, <clears throat> growing up as a member of the church for many years, I heard Ephesians 5 19 rattled off all the time. It wasn't until I was on my own as an adult sitting down studying that I actually began to see what Ephesians 5 is actually talking about, okay? the argument that Paul is driving at. And so I want us to understand the context first of this particular statement. And then I want us to spend some time looking at what it says about singing. Okay? So to put this particular passage in its context, we're going to start in a very broad way, and we're just going to look at the book itself first. Now this book is written, it's the greatest letter ever written about the church itself, and it is very stretching. Um, every, we believe in verbal inspiration, that is every word is important, but in Ephesians that's like that concept on steroids, like 
every single word, you have to line them up just perfectly and define them correctly and then piece them together by phrase and sentence. And uh, some of these sentences are seven or eight verses long, and so you're trying to follow the grammar of that thing, and it gets a little hairy. But he focuses in on the church and the spiritual nature of the church, that so many people view it as a brick-and-mortar thing. And Ephesians just will not let that happen. And it pushes you to see a realm beyond the physical realm into the spiritual realm and to live in the physical realm in light of what has happened in the spiritual realm and what is transpiring in the spiritual realm and how those two realms interact with one another. Okay? So this book, in the first three chapters, uh, it's been referred to as the doctrinal indicatives. Uh, Indicative in Greek is the voice that is used to describe statements of fact. Okay? Statements of fact. So when we say doctrinal indicatives, the first three chapters focus in on, and Paul is very, in most of his letters, he follows this line where he will state what God has said on a particular subject he's driving at, okay? And so he makes these statements, these doctrinal indicatives about what God has done to save us in Christ in Ephesians 1 through 3. Then when you come to chapters 4 through 6, they are moral imperatives, okay? That is, you will run into imperatives, commands, and things that are incumbent upon us to keep. And so when you see the relationship, the moral imperatives, okay, they have to be laid upon the foundation of doctrinal indicatives. That is, to understand what you're supposed to be doing, you have to understand it in light of what Christ has done. Okay? And you can't get those backwards. Okay? So obviously what we're looking at in singing is in the second half with these moral imperatives. But it's founded upon the doctrinal indicatives. That is what God has done for us in Christ. So first observation would be this. My singing in worship is founded in what God has done for us in Christ to save us. And to the degree that I understand that is to the degree then that I will sing to God you can't separate them all right now let's think about this particular section you have a reference to the Christian walk in chapter 4 chapter 4 and verse 1 to walk in a worthy manner chapter 4 and verse 17 no longer walk as the Gentiles do chapter 5 and verse 2 walk in love <clears throat> chapter 5 verse 8 walk as children of light chapter 5 and verse 15 Look carefully then how you walk. So this is a discussion of walking is a obviously a synonym for the manner of our lives. Walking takes you in one direction and it's a continual movement. Okay? So walking in that direction. But there's also another theme that dominates this section from chapter 4 and verse 1 all the way through the end of chapter 5. And that is <clears throat> one another. Chapter 4 and verse 2, bearing with one another. Chapter 4 and verse 25. We are members one of another. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. In our, in our text, in chapter 5 and verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then in verse 21, submitting to one another. So in this context, we're talking about how Christians who have been redeemed by Christ should walk and even primarily should walk and how they relate to to one another because one of the things we're seeing about these actions of worship we've talked about um, obviously we've talked about prayer we've talked about Lord the Lord's Supper and now we're in this study and we've got a couple of more coming one of the things we see about it is that worship has a horizontal element that is our relationship with one another and it has a vertical element That is, our worship is directed to God. And you can't really ignore either of those. And singing is one of those things that falls right in, not surprisingly, falls right into that category. Okay? And so you see these passages about the Christian walk and one another. Okay? That kills the idea of individualism. I want, I want, I want. With all respect in the world, why should your I want trump everybody else's I want?
churches are going to be in chaos if you do that. But if you have a group of people together who say, we want to walk and we want to do what the Lord wants us to do, and we want to serve one another, that's the attitude that redeemed people have. Then when we come to the paragraph that was read for us a moment ago in, in chapter 5, verses 15 through 21, <clears throat> we see this begin to develop. You see this, don't do this, but do this. Let's try and illustrate it here. See, 5, 15, and 16. I don't want you not to be unwise, but to be wise. This is a common refrain. He's been doing this a lot before this paragraph, but he continues this reasoning. I don't want you to do this, but I want you to do this. So don't be unwise, but be wise. Don't be foolish, but understand. Don't be drunk, be filled with the Spirit. So you see this back and forth that's taking place. Okay? Then, when we come to the passage itself, in chapter 5, verses 18 through 21, this is how the sentence is put together. All right? You have two imperative statements that are commands, and they're both found in verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, imperative one. Okay? but be filled with the Spirit, imperative too. Now, <clears throat> then we have what follows are known as five participles, okay? And these participles describe what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And you can see them most likely in your English translation because they all end with I-N-G, okay? Addressing or speaking, singing, making, giving, and submitting. So that's the flow of the discussion. So chapter 5 and verse 19 of Ephesians, when we cite it, we need to understand what Paul is doing in the context before we take it and we run with it. We saw this with the Lord's Supper, right? A lot of people want to go to 1 Corinthians 11. But 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord's Supper is an illustration. It's not the main matter of discussion, right? And so when we're looking at this text, we need to keep that in mind. And we'll drive at that a little bit more here in a minute. <clears throat> so that's how this is put together. We're going to spend our time with 18 and 19 because 20 and 21 are, are different ways in which a spirit-filled life is expressed. First, it's expressed through singing, and then it's also expressed <clears throat> in being thankful and then in submitting to one another. But we want to look at the directions for singing. So let's look at that and begin, first of all, <clears throat> with this setting. Now, the reason we um, read these two passages, you can see how similar they are, right? This chart shows you how similar they are. Ephesians and Colossians have been called twin epistles. Um, Ephesians focuses more on the church that belongs to Christ. Colossians focuses more on the Christ that belongs to the church, but their imagery is similar. Uh, their arguments are very similar. Um, they're not actually that far from each other, the two cities. And so these two verses kind of help give commentary on one another. Um, and this will become important as we try and piece all of this together about what God wants in singing. So, as we now study what the Bible's saying about singing, <clears throat> let's begin first of all with the setting in which we find ourselves. So, what is Paul talking about here? There are two schools of thought here. Okay? Two schools of thought. Some people believe that Paul is talking about and contrasting. You remember, not do this, but do this. So that's a contrast. Some people believe he is contrasting the worship of false gods versus the worship of the true God. And they get that because you have something like the cult of Dionysius, who was the god of wine. And they got drunk as part of their worship because as they lost control of their bodies, they felt that they connected to the divine through the loss of control which was brought about by inebriation. And so when some people read this text, they think he's saying, don't be drunk with wine, don't get involved in the frenzied, idolatrous worship of Dionysius, but rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's an attractive argument. The problem I have with it is I just don't think it fits the context of the passage. Because the context of the passage begins back in chapter 4 and verse 17 when it says, do not walk as the Gentiles. And what he's been dealing with in this whole context is, are moral issues. They're not necessarily how you worship in idolatry. And so I think what he's doing is just giving a blanket statement 
about contrasting the way of drunkenness to the way of the Spirit. The way of foolishness and idolatry and living according to the standards of the world and the way of following and living by the standards of Christ, which they were called to do as Christians. Now, some people say, well, if you take that interpretation, you can't, then this text cannot be referring to singing and worship. My answer is, yes, it can. Because the text, the first thing he says about <clears throat> being filled with the Spirit is what? Addressing one another or speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, there are multiple ways we can do that, but one of the ways we do that, what is one of the primary ways Christians address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? In corporate worship. It's got to be one of the only ways to fulfill it. And so this can be a discussion about worship, even if it's not directly connected or contrasted to the worship of idolatry. And so we're addressing one another. Now, <clears throat> let's look then at the cause of singing. All right? The cause of singing. He says, be filled with the Spirit, or an explanation is given in chapter 3 and verse 16, to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, Ephesians has a great emphasis upon the Christian's relationship with the Spirit. In chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We're being built by the Spirit into the temple of God. He wants the Spirit to open our eyes to understand what Christ, God has done for us in Christ, 117 and 316. But let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, as Colossians has it, dwell to abide, to live in you, and richly or abundantly, the idea of the Word of God, the message of Christ overflowing out of you. So our singing is directly connected to how we understand the message of Christ and how moved we are with it. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it bubble up and come over the sides. And as you bubble up and come over the sides, when you Christians get together, you'll talk to each other about it in song which is what we do when we're singing. We're talking about the redemption we have in Christ in song. And so that's why when we studied spiritual disciplines last year, at the end of last year in the um, library class, we spent a lot of time talking about Bible intake. And the reason we spent time talking about Bible intake is because it feeds so much of everything else that we do. Christianity is a taught religion. It's not one that is felt primarily. It does move you. But it first must be entered into your mind. and has to continually fill your mind. And as it fills you, it moves you. Feelings don't come first. Information does. Then feelings. Feelings without information is foolishness. What are you feeling? How are you feeling? Why are you feeling that way? How do you know that you're feeling correctly? It doesn't work. So, the cause behind the singing, our relationship to the Word of God, my relationship to singing in the worship services is connected to my relationship with the message of Christ. Now, <clears throat> let's move then to the horizontal element because that's how I think this is addressed in this particular verse when he says in Ephesians our text addressing one another or uh, speaking to one another I think is probably the better translation the ESV says uh, addressing and then teaching and admonishing one another <clears throat> so as we said speaking is the obvious translation and so when you speak okay the particular Greek word I'm not really sure why the ESV translator show, chose addressing uh, they know a lot more about the language than I do, but I don't understand why they chose that word. Um, I mean, I think the New American Standard, King James, a lot of other primary translations stick with speaking because the word itself is pretty plain. Um, <clears throat> so you're speaking to one another. What does that tell you then about the music that God is wanting us to make? 
What is speaking? It's verbal. It's verbal. It's understandable. It's coherent. It's not a frenzied chaos of a message that nobody could make out if they were trying. The singing that God wants is verbal in its nature. You can communicate a message. And so as we verbally sing, as you look at the Colossians passage, we're teaching one another. We're informing one another. If a person were to come into our assembly, and this is why we have to pay close attention to the songs that we sing, because what is the message we're communicating? There are songs <clears throat> that when you look at them and you look at the message of them, you have to remember these songs, many of them are written by human beings with a theological backdrop. And there are songs that I cannot sing because what that song is saying is say a prayer and you'll be saved. And I can't believe that. The Bible will not allow me to believe that. I don't believe in the sinner's prayer. I don't think it's there. I've never seen it. So I can't sing a song that teaches something that I would never stand up and publicly teach. We're teaching one another in that process. But also admonishing one another, which is the warning side of it. And so you would have... <clears throat> Songs and, and, you know, some people would look at them and say, well, you know, why would, why would you sing a song that even mentioned hell? Because the Bible told us to. What is admonition? It's not encouragement. It's admonition. Warning. Not every song is intended to make us feel good on the inside. It's meant to prod us. Singing is another way of communicating the message of the gospel and communicating the realities of the spiritual world. It's not always intended for it to be comfortable. It's meant to call upon you to think, to give those warnings. And also when you add in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26, singing is also for edification. So by verbally sending forth words, <clears throat> we are teaching one another about the gospel, we're teaching one another about many truths that are found in these songs. We're admonishing and warning each other not to walk away from that truth. And we're building each other up as we remind ourselves of the glorious truth of the gospel. So, <clears throat> he says this. I want you to listen to these words. This, uh, these are from Dr. Andrew McGowan, who is a... Um, Anglican scholar, graduated PhD from Notre Dame with a special emphasis in early church worship. Listen to his observations in observing their writings <clears throat> about how music operated for them. He says this, since music was a vehicle for the expression of the thoughts and feelings of ancient Christians as prayer and praise, and as we will see, their focus was typically more verbal than musical. What does he mean? They cared more about the words that you sang than they did the melodies and the different things that were behind them. Listen to this statement that he also makes later. This is partly because, as we have seen, singing was actually understood as a form of reading rather than as music in the modern sense. It was a means of the proclamation of the text, whether of praise or prayer or edification. We're not singing these songs. They, Christians, the earliest Christians, did not understand us to be singing songs for musical entertainment. That's not the way they understood it. They understood musical expression simply as another way of communicating the message of the gospel. If you take a look at how 
some people, even in all the sincerity in the world, worship. You can't even understand a word they're saying. It seems as if musical accompaniment is that which dominates. We want to make it aesthetically a please, pleasing to everyone. But what the New Testament is saying here and what the early Christians were saying was that stuff doesn't really matter. What matters is that these words are true. So then we have to ask ourselves this question because we're speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and there may be some differences there. There's debate along that. But what is the difference between a psalm and a hymn and a spiritual song? Um, I've not seen anything that persuaded me either way, to be honest with you. Either way, the idea is that they're spiritual in their content. So here's the question we need to ask ourselves as we sing in worship. When I sing in worship, do I sing in such a way that people around me, when they see me sing, would take me seriously in what I'm singing? For an example, <clears throat> we're going to sing an invitation song in just a few minutes. Or we invite people who are weary to come to Jesus. There's a fountain free, it is for you and me. Let's take that one. Not we're going to sing that one, but just as an example here. Okay? I wasn't changing on you, Dwayne. Um, <clears throat> he got kind of worried, looked there for a second. Um, now, I want you to think about how you sing that. Because for a lot of us, it's kind of like we, you know, like we can't get out of the pew. And then it's like, you know, there's a fountain free, it is for you and me, and it makes me think of the fountain drink I'm going to get at lunch. And um, so if I'm sitting here in the assembly and I'm an unbeliever and I need Jesus, my heart is broken and I need Jesus. I looked at you seeing it, I would think this is not the place to find it. But if I saw people who I believed because of how they sang with fervor, that there is a fountain that is free. It doesn't cost you anything. It's for you, it's for me. And then we say, come, let us haste to its brink. And usually that's the part we drag the most in that song. Come, let us haste to its brink. Well, I'm fired up. Let's run. If you believe that fountain is opened in Zechariah 13 and verse 1 for uncleanness and sinfulness that flowed from the side of Jesus, if you believe that fountain is open, act like it. Sing like it. If you believe that's the cure of the world, then sing like it. But don't insult him. Don't insult him. The greatest message in the world does not deserve to be mumbled. It deserves to be sung loudly and clearly for people to see. So when I sing, and people say, well, you know, when I don't sing, it's not a big deal. And no, before the question is asked, it's not addressing anybody. I don't know who sings, and I don't know who doesn't sing. Most of the time my glasses are off, and if I don't have my glasses on, I can't see anything. So there you go. And sometimes in moments like this when I have to say difficult things, I keep them off because I don't really want to see if somebody gets mad about it either. So, <clears throat> I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. <clears throat> when I am not singing, not only does it say something about my relationship with God, it also says something about my relationship. And people say, you know, I'm, I'm not hurting anybody else. Yes, you are. When you refuse to add your voice to the encouragement, you refuse to encourage your brothers and sisters who sit in this room. You are doing something. So there's a horizontal side. Then <clears throat> there's also the vertical side, which is we're singing to God or to the Lord, 
depending upon which text you're looking at in Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. So singing is this beautiful expression to God. This is the primary purpose of singing, right? Horizontal, the benefits we get, those are kind of secondary. The primary purpose of singing is to glorify God. And so when we're singing, we're expressing our thankfulness to God. And listen, I'm not standing up here saying I get this right all the time. Or even most of the time. People say, you know, my mind wanders during worship and it's hard for me to stay focused. Yeah. You know how hard it is to partake of the Lord's Supper when you're thinking about point three on your sermon and how weak it is? I get it. No one is saying we're perfect at this. That doesn't mean we should not push ourselves to be what God has called us to be. And that we need to think that how we're singing, how I'm singing, God is here. And I'm either showing my thankfulness or I'm not. Because when you look at the worship of God in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5, we learn that we praise God in song for a couple of reasons. One, for who he is and his holiness, Revelation 4 and verse 8, but also for what he has done for us in the creation of the world, chapter 4, verses uh, 10 and 11, and our redemption in Christ, chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. We're praising him for those things. Think about praising God for creating us. In a doxology that Paul gives at the end of Romans 11, he says, for all things are from him and through him and to him. What does he mean? All things are from him, through him, and to him. You know what? This is what we need to think about. First of all, my life is from God. My life is a gift from God. I would not exist had he not created me. You would not exist. You are alive because God created you. My life is through him. As Paul would say in Mars Hill, in him we live and move and we have our very being. The only reason I walk out of this place alive today is because God sustained me. But here's the question we have to answer. Will my life be lived to him? And will I express my gratefulness and live my life so that not only I would sing to him, but that others would sing to him and that others would come to know him and be moved and transformed? Singing, when it is done correctly, here's... I know very little about music except the fact that I love it. And not a specific portion of music, all kinds of music. Music has the ability to connect to the souls of people. It has a transformative element to it. One of the things that I hold primary, especially when I watch a person perform a song talking secularly, is... I want to see if they connect with the song. If they don't connect with the song, even, I don't care how pretty it is. I don't care anything for it. Singing is one of the way, one of the gifts that God has given to us whereby we can express ourselves and engage the wholeness of our being in something. When we're singing in worship, our minds are supposed to be active as we contemplate the truths. Our souls are being stirred by the message of that truth. Our bodies are being used as we project words. If you love God with all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength, your body projecting, your mind engaging, your soul stirring, it's worship. And as William Temple said, all of these things put together is the greatest expression of which human beings are capable. 
point of his directed toward God. So when I refuse to sing and worship, when I don't give what I should, I don't give God what he deserves. And believe me, he's earned it. So, in a moment, we're going to continue singing. Sing an invitation song, probably a closing song or something else. Let's tell God what we think of Him. Let's show God what we think of Him. People say, worship is boring. That's because you're not engaged. You've never worshipped yet. You've never worshipped yet. And if you are not a Christian, we're going to sing a song and we're going to encourage you to become one. You don't have to respond publicly right now about it, but we would love to have you thinking about it and love to be able to talk to you about it. Or as a New Testament Christian <clears throat> who is um, struggling, who hasn't been faithful maybe as they should, we want to encourage you to. Because I'll be honest with you, you'll probably say amen to this after this sermon, but anyway, um, I've sat through some sermons in my life and they were pretty stinking bad. It wasn't the sermon that convicted me. It was the invitation song. So let's keep preaching while we're singing. You think I did a terrible job? Probably wouldn't disagree with you. Then do it better. Do it better. Let's teach, let's preach the gospel as we stand and sing this song. <clears throat>